So, all right. Well, um, we'll just open in prayer and we'll begin. Um, dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we're just so thankful um, for this chance that we can be studying the the witness of such great witnesses that have come before us, um, these men of faith in the early church. Pray that you would open our minds and help us to really comprehend it and value from everything that they have provided us. In Jesus' precious name, we pray. Amen. So, um, I think the mode that I found that was working a little bit better was if I share my desktop, and that way I can be a little bit more interactive. So let me make sure that I share the right screen. I did that right. Yeah. So if I put it here. Okay, so um, we have been covering a lot of ground and probably a, a good way to describe how we're going through the material is kind of in a survey fashion. And so um, we gave like an introduction, what is the whole concept of um, looking at their early church fathers. There's a word that I introduced. Um, the patristics. Right, yeah. Yeah, so we're studying the patristics. And um, the what the author does, and in English, we only have one word for history, but in German, they have two words. One is historia, which is telling the facts. It's like being a reporter. And the other one is geschichte, whereas you're, it's the telling. You're telling the, the story. And so uh, that's what I like about the textbook is they, they do that um, in, a, in a very nice way. And so we're really trying to do that here is trying to have a telling and have us um, meet as if it were firsthand these individuals and um, see how that helps us to, to grow in our faith. So we talked about Clement who was the individual that probably was just barely not in the the, um, in the Bible. Yeah. And so we, I, I almost would like to call it, this was like third Corinthians. He was so humble, he wouldn't even want to have his name put in the in the letter. But because of some of the other patristics, we know that that who, who wrote it. Some people say that he may have written the Didache. And so it just means the, the, the teaching of the, of the disciples. And we looked at a couple of things of what it talked about, of how you should be celebrating um, communion, how baptism should take place. Um, it has the Lord's Prayer and other types of things in terms of how you should be doing um, church. So it gives us a nice early representation of when they were first trying to figure that out and how to communicate that. Irenaeus, we saw how that he was a faithful witness that literally was um, chained all the way from Antioch in the modern day Syria, which was Paul's missionary base, all the way to through Asia Minor, modern day Turkey. So finally it was as far as they could go and then they took, was on a boat and brought to um, Rome where he was executed and became a martyr. Polycarp was someone that you know intimately well. He lived to be um, um, fairly mature in age, 86 years old, and at that time was still going to be faithful to his witness to the Lord and, mm. and um, declared his faith all the way up until then. We have a couple of these writers who we don't know exactly who they were, but we have the writings of that individual. And so Diagnosis is the one of, of that and um, we begin to see a movement here that starts to take place where there's this genre of um, apologetics, apology, that they would make an argument for the, the faith. And what we know today is Christian apologetics is really a, a maturation of what was started way back then. So Justin Martyr was a 
philosopher. And so he really was trying to find what was the, the best system that would make sense and did a, a spiritual and philosophical tour. And he started to see the witness of these um, Christ followers who, would, instead of just um, de denouncing their faith and saying that um, the emperor was a god, that they would choose to die. Polycarp was that kind of an individual. And so he was seeing these people, and then people told him about who Jesus of Nazareth was and how this was really the, the fulfillment of um, uh, philosophical thought. It was philosophical thought at the highest. And so interesting how in multiple ways we can see how Christianity can be brought alongside other areas. Um, I like to think that it can be brought to make science a lot more effective. It's, you know, having our theological development is stuff that should touch all areas of our life. Philosophy is definitely one of those areas. Um, the author actually spent two chapters going over the life of Irenaeus and the impact of what his writings were. And, um, and Against All Heresies is one of his, his biggest and most famous work. And it was we, we tried to go through book at a time to give a little bit of a highlight of what it was. It, it was like a series of letters. And the first, they, they just tried to describe in accurate terms really what Gnosticism was all about. There were a lot of different homegrown versions of that. It wasn't like a homogeneous type of belief, but there were some general things that, you know, spiritual is good, the body is bad, the physical is bad. And so he was just breaking it down and show, showing how true knowledge is what that we have in Christ is really the higher thing than to be thinking about this hidden knowledge that Gnostics were always trying to um, argue for. And ultimately, the, the battle for the Bible is that the, the purity of Scripture um, is really the place where we get the ultimate and best understanding of the true nature and knowledge of God. And we are now, so that's really um, where we've covered up to, to this point. And so it's been a nice survey of the, the early um, patristics. Now we're starting to get into um, an, another area where we, we talked about some of these major schools. There was a school of Antioch and then there was a school of Alexandria. We're going to have a couple individuals that were going to be based out of this school of Alexandria. We'll get a little bit more background on that and then start to, to progress forward. Any questions? No. Okay. So um, the Clement of Alexandria um, was, was an interesting individual. Um, we don't know too much about his background, um, but his based on the things that we do know that he came pretty pretty much from a pagan um, family and that was the, the 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 nature of religion that he would have understood he, so he uh, he grew up in Athens and was educated there and he he determined to gain wisdom and um, as a result kind of like Justin Martyr in some ways he started to go to these various locations looking to have better understanding of um, philosophical ideas, religious spirituality. So he went to Italy, to Syria, to Palestine. And when, um, and finally he met this one individual that became his teacher and someone that he really um, spent a lot of time with and ultimately led to um, an area of ministry that he spent a lot of his life doing. Um, and I'm terrible with some of these names, and you know, I've never heard them pronounced, so I just kind of try and do it phonetically. Um, Phineas. And so here he found someone that had the spirit that he was yearning for. And so he stuttered under Phineas to work with him and ultimately succeeding him on the order around 200 AD. And so maybe I'll just go back to um, some of these 
um, timelines to give you an idea. And so um, we're getting out around here and um, we're not quite to Hippolytus yet. Um, we talked about Irenaeus and so that's a little bit of a snippet. Um, so here's Clement of Alexandria that we're starting to, to see. So we're going to talk about Clement of Alexandria. We're going to be talking about Origen. He's going to be coming next. And then um, Tertullian is another individual. Maybe we'll get to Hippolytus as well. So this gives you a little bit of an idea. So we're getting towards the, the middle to the end of the, the second century. Um, and we, we have a little bit of insight into um, some of the other players there. Um, so Marcus Aurelius, if you remember the gladiator, again, we're kind of getting into that time. And um, here will be a, another um, emperor that we'll be talking about where, where there was a great persecution. And you can see these little things that there was these times when there was more significant persecution that was taking place in the church. And so we're going to be landing in one of those areas of persecution under Marcus Aurelius. Um, and uh, we may get all the way out here as we do our survey. So that's a, a little bit more context. Um, so doing our spiritual family tree, we're slowly getting to about as far down as we can go. And um, Clement of Alexandria still had some kind of a connection through Irenaeus that could be traced back to the apostles. And we're starting to get to the end of where people could have that kind of a spiritual linkage to the, the, the apostles. And so as they're getting more and more removed, the importance of the church, the, the organized structure of what that was, having a more defined Bible is going to become more and more important rather than getting the, the eyewitness, the stories, and then the passing on of those stories. Um, we, the, the writing of scriptures <clears throat> actually is another interesting point, and um, the earliest letters of the New Testament are, are easily dated in the, in the 50s AD, so we're only talking like maybe 10 to 15 years after the, the, um, the resurrection when these took place. And even before that, they had these creedal statements and we're really locking in the, the essence of what the faith was and the fact that they have these stories that are very strong oral tradition. And um, you would have these people that, that knew the apostles that, and then the people that would be staying at, you know, they'd be going through these, these stories. The people that were longer in the faith that have heard them, that were predated them, we would make sure that they were accurately transmitted. And we see examples of how that was um, trying to be secured in like the writings of Paul in 1 Corinthians 15 of 3 through 4. He talks about, I pass on to you what I have received. And then he gives a little creed. He says that, um, that Christ died according to scripture and that he rose again on the third day according to scripture. And then he lists all these people that had seen the, the resurrected Christ. So um, we're, we're going to be focusing on this one school now, in a little bit more detail in this um, school of Alexandria, starting with Clement. I have a question. What, what happened to uh, Tertius or Tert uh, Tatian? Tatian? Um, it's just one of the individuals that I, the, the author didn't really focus on in this, um, in this text. And so I, I haven't actually looked at him much. We, we, we did talk, talk about Justin Martyr. Yeah. So um, we, we have that connection. Um, let me just do a quick back up here. You know, it, that's where it starts to get to be a little bit of um, personal choice. So like what yeah. do you cover and what you don't cover? Or for, probably maybe who are the more um, prominent or the ones who made the biggest impact or bigger impacts? Not to say they weren't important, but to say, you know, uh, 
to cover the book and I mean if you know just to make the book um, more about the more prominent fathers I'm guessing yeah um, so I'm just doing a quick synopsis on him what I can find here so as it talks about here it, it says that he died about 215 um, I'm sorry, 185. So, oh, my computer's not. I'm trying to make it. So, um, That's the update flash player, so I'm glad you're not seeing this. But, um, so, um, so he was a Christian writer and theologian of the second century. Um, his most influential work was. Um, Diaestrion, a biblical paraphrase or harmony of the four gospels that became the standard text of the four gospels in the Syriac speaking churches until the fifth century. So um, he definitely had his place that was worthwhile. Um, so I wouldn't, wouldn't want to belittle that contribution at all. Yeah. So. Um, Anyway, good question, and I appreciate you asking. And, and anything that you want to have us chat a little bit more, we'll collectively just um, go explore it. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So, this is one of the things that I'll keep coming back to. You know, that spiritual pedigree chart, and here is just sort of a map of where these people ministered. You're going to see how we have the school of Alexandria I mentioned, the school of Antioch which is where um, Paul had his missionary um, base. We're going to be having um, Turkey um, and um, Asia, Asia Minor, as it was called back then, but that was a, a, an area where the church was very active. Of course, in Rome, the, that eventually became their preeminent place for the, the Western church, Carthage. Um, and we're going to be bumping into um, Tertullian that we may get to that in to today. And so those are just some of the, the main points. And so Alexandria, so we're going to be talking about Clement of Rome, and then we're going to be talking about or origin. Um, probably won't get to Athanasius. Um, and then there's a, a heretical, some of the people here have some heretical views, as, including um, Arius, uh, who denied um, the Trinity. And so we have some of these things that the, the church itself had to start to grapple with. And the Council of Nicaea is where that started to, to come out. Um, so um, under Clement, we have the, the persecution of um, Servius, Emperor Servius in 202 AD. And so Clement was forced out of Alexandria. So this great library, great place where you can have Christian scholarship um, at his school. And so um, he had to go into um, um, hiding. And so it was a little bit more difficult to track what he was doing at that time. Um, so he may have visited um, Cappadocia and Antioch. And later he died in 211 or uh, maybe 215 um, AD. And um, apart from some fragments quotes by later writers, uh, that we have a handful of things that were um, saved um, the exhortation to the heathen, the instructor, the, the stromata, and then there's um, several other things. Who is this rich man that, that shall be saved? And there's also the Things that there are few fragments or, or still exact excerpts 
from the Theotis. Can um, I move back really quick? I'm sorry. Sure. I just wanted to write some of these things down. Let me hopefully go in the right. Is that the slide you wanted? Yeah, please. Okay. These are also in the um, the lecture notes that and I, can, I am slightly updating these as I go. But that's also oh, the, yes, the, uh, the notes that we have the packet. Yeah, so just um, when you're reviewing the material, just keep aware of that's another resource for you to be. Oh, yeah, but if, I, if I miss anything from now on, I'll make sure I can just go back there. Yeah, but I, I appreciate engagement, so don't worry about it. OK, I got it. Thank you. Yeah. And um, the way the author talks about it is he calls it there's this trilogy, the exhortation to the Greeks is written to philosophical but unbelieving um, audience and that's apology. So it's once again this um, this genre uh, of apology. Um, and like um, Justin Martyr, they, they saw how philosophy could be a way of, of helping people come to faith, giving them an idea how to to rationally give a, an infrastructure to, to put all this together. The second thing was something we called the instructor. And it's, it, it provides rules for living the Christian life for, for, for new Christians. And so um, Christianity 101 or whatever you want to, to call it. Um, and looking at you know the the living word would be this meant to have the person be really the instructor and um logo says divine word is is found in all truth and one of the people that helped me early on in my faith is all truth is god's truth and this would kind of tie into to this philosophy and just the the, the witness of um, nature itself um and the third is a it um, just it's a discussion of true knowledge as opposed to, to Gnostics. This this whole um, movement of Gnosticism is something that has definitely had to be contend with and the distortion of what it tried to move people and how they would be viewing the nature of Christianity. Um, so philosophy is, is needed for true Gnosis. Gnosis is a Greek word for knowledge, and the seeds of divine truth is in philosophy. So it's wonderful that you can see that. And he reminds the reader that Moses is older than Plato, and so they're so stuck on Plato. But once you go back a couple of millennia, then you can be talking about Moses. And um, philosophy is in the Greek Testament. We see philosophical arguments and things that we can derive and develop even further that, that are in there. So we'll spend a little bit of time um, giving a perspective on Alexandria, how it came about. And this is the, the, um, the launching point for this school, this, um, and where we have Clement of Alexandria basing his work. So Alexander the Great established this city in 323 BC. Became the, the center of, of a specific empire, the Ptolemy Empire. Was based on one of the three successors of Alexander. So um, when he passed on, he says, well, who should be a successor? And he said, the stronger. So basically the kingdom started to disintegrate in the Ptolemies was the people that were there in Alexandria, the Seleucides, uh, and also the Macedonians. Seleucids, I think that's a better way of pronouncing that, and the Macedonians. Cleopatra was the last Ptolemy ruler, died in 31 BC. Um, when the Roman rule was established. And that's not the Cleopatra that we think about um, with um, the uh, actress. Uh, <laughs> like getting brain cramp, but right? uh, Solomon. Um, so 
and so it was a port for grain and other foods from from the Nile. And so it was a port of call, um, and it was the largest and most important city after Rome. Um, it was an intellectually important um, area. It was the, the greatest center of learning in the ancient world for 600 years. It had libraries and a museum. And so it was a center of, um, center of Hellenistic philosophy. This is just a fancy word if you haven't heard about it for the, the Greek Roman philosophy. Hellenization was, you know, like Greeks and the barbarians. You know, it was just a word that they, they used. Philosophical schools of all sorts established and flourished in this area. So you could see how the, the, the school of Alexandria in Christian thought would be, have some coloring of this um, societal background. Um, there, unfortunately, the, the, this great library that we they had was burnt, and the question that's being asked here is who actually burnt it? Plutarch, which was a, a historian who actually used the, the type of um, genre that the um, Gospels are written in, is something called a Greek Roman biography or bios. And so that's who Plutarch is. Um, others have said it was maybe the Emperor um, Philodius or, or others. And so it's, it's, in some ways it's not that important, but um, anyway, that there is some um, different thought, thoughts of what happened. So it's a tragic loss, but we do still have a lot of things from antiquity. Um, traditionally, Mark was the first bishop in, in this, the church in this area. And because of the philosophical milieu that existed, Gnosticisms of various sorts were prevalent. Um, Orthodox Christianity also thrived with an important Christian school. So Clement of Alexandria, he, he wrote extensively about what it meant to be a true Gnostic, trying to, to play on their, the term that they held so dear. He, he led the school that was there and likely was a teacher of origin who's, who's actually a, even a more um, well-known, although in some, some cases a little bit controversial, um, being part of the school. Um, he was influenced by a philosopher by the name of Philo, and so that's another thing that we know. Hmm. We don't know exactly when he accepted um, the Lord, but we do know that once he converted, he, he, he wanted to learn that faith from the very best of teachers. So he wanted to go right to the, to the best sources that he could find. Um, so he moved from home and, and was looking for the best education. And in his quest, he went all over. And um, where he finally found himself in Alexandria is where he planted roots. And so the, the big problem that he was trying to deal with as he was coming to faith and getting strong in that is that he saw that Gnosticism was a very much a strong philosophical um, worldview that he was going to have to deal with. So Alexandria had enjoyed um, um, a long peace coming up to this point. Um, but still, that they had to deal with heretic, heretical sex. And Gnosticism was a group that promoted, um, pr that prompted Irenaeus to write his book. And um, so this, this Gnostic ideas were just everywhere. And so it was trying to, to leverage the ideas of Plato's and Stoics. And, and in terms of the the, the Greek Roman perspective of the spiritual is good, the, the physical is not. It doesn't matter what you do with the physical, but you want to be focusing on the spiritual. And so it, it just was um, a, very easy for Christianity to get contaminated. And so he was in the midst of trying to, to decouple that and continue on that. Now we'll go come back and think about the Didache. So the Didache 
told Christians, so how are they going to start to make some distinctions and what is Clement trying to do in that area? The Didache told Christians to fast on Wednesdays and Fridays. We're trying to make the distinctions from what the Jews did. But then he's trying to talk about who people would like to call themselves Christian Gnostics. Um, they, they were thinking that the Gnostic understanding, too, that hidden meaning of the fasting of these days, uh, I mean of Wednesday and Friday, for the, for the one is dedicated to Hermes and the other to Aphrodite. And so this is some of the things that they would overlay, just these other kind of Gnostic ideas, you know, individuals that were key in um, Greek thought and were used in Gnosticism. Um, we also see, as did in the Didache, that Christians have set times of prayer, including the, the sundry Eucharist and the prayer three times per day specified by the Didache. But what did the, the Christi Christian Gnostics want to say? They observed these fixed times, but would never just leave it at that. And so there was like yet a little bit more hidden knowledge that they would be like to lay in on top of that. Following Paul's counsel in Philippians 4, Clement's goal is to pray constantly, pray without ceasing, maintaining a continual conversation with God. There's no hidden knowledge or revelation. The Didache practices have no deeper Gnostic parallel. So playing on Gnostic ideas, one can think of a, quote, true Gnostic who would find the fullness of Christ alone. Clement longs to bring this, this the Gnostic to this understanding. They really want to have them understand the deepest truth of Scripture and the nature of what it means to be a believer. So Clement was really one of the first people that you could say was a, a scholar. He, he's starting to think fairly um, comprehensively um, in theological lines of reasoning. Um, this, is, this, of course, is not the only gospel texts um, Clement cites. And so um, he, he would be focusing on the gospel texts, but he was also focusing on, on other things as well. Um, he he wrote only a few years after the appearance of Irenaeus's book. Um, but like Irenaeus, recognized the four gospels that have been handed down to us that these were significant, you know, and most notable of the, the life of Christ. Um, he quotes from nearly every book of what we now know as the New Testament. And um, here we get a little bit of an idea of how that, how much that hurt that was. He, he cites passages from the New Testament over 2,000 times, the Old Testament 150 times, and Greek classics over 360 times. Um, we'll be talking about Jerome later, but writing two centuries later, Jerome called Clement the most learned of all their early fathers. And so he was an intellectual um, and one of the things that you'll see from the patristics is there's a wide range of personalities, even like the apostles and the gospels. Do you think like Dr. Luke, he was very scholarly, very um, profound and very knowledgeable about Greek. And then you have others like John who just really were focusing on knowing Jesus in an intimate way. And we're seeing that with these folks that were now getting the chance to have more exposure. Um, so Justin had been the explorer who made the initial contact between the divine wisdom of the, of the gospel and the philosophy of the Greeks. Clement was the pioneer who settled down, cleared the stumps, and planted a garden in the field of Christian philosophy. So he really, you know, laid in deep to what would, this was all about. Um, Johannes Quantus is... Um, a fairly well-known scholar in modern times, and here is a quote from him talking about climate. We owe it above to, to him if scholarly thinking and research are recognized in the church. He proved that the faith and philosophy, gospel and secular learning are, are not enemies but belong together. So we can definitely be um, putting um, 
our faith into other areas and, and bring them together and as a result get a much deeper understanding. So um, it's unfortunate that um, just think of how much more he could have been able to um, develop if he had more time to, to do that. But this is where the another persecution started to to take place. Um, so his tenure at the school that he was so instrumental in working in was cut short. And so in the, the year AD 202, there was a fierce um, persecution that erupted in Alexandria under the Emperor Servius. I have a question. So um, do do we kind of because I, I saw it said that that he succeeded uh, Pantaneus uh, in 200 AD and yeah. then the persecution happened in 202. So is it safe to assume he only really he only had two years to come up with all those writings? Um, writing written would, before his I succession. Would not, I wouldn't put it that way. I would be saying is that you know, um, just because he may not have been in as a senior position at the very beginning, mm -hmm. um, he still was you know profound and developing in his understanding and writing these things, mm -hmm. and. Um, after this, you know, he, he gets out of town and, and here it may have been that up until 211 or 215. So that's like first, like maybe 15 plus years for him to be developing what he's, he wrote. But that, that's a good point for us to be thinking about how these timelines all fit together. Um, So this persecution hits, he can no longer stay there in his teaching role. And so he now has until like the time of his death that um, 215. So it's again there as, as well. Um, the school shuts its door and Clement fit, fled. So not only, you know, because of the persecution was so bad, they, they everybody had to flee. So that's a quick little synopsis on um, Clement. Any other comments or questions on that? No. Um, Origen is, is an interesting character. Um, has a distinctive personality, extremely, he wrote a lot. And so we have a lot of his writings are still um, with us. And he is a little bit younger than um, Clement. So that's one thing that we, we know about. So he was born to a Christian home. And so he was in and around this persecution as well. Um, survived it and eventually came back to um, Alexandria. So his father was Leonidas who was martyred during this persecution where um, Clement um, had to escape. Um, Origen encouraged his father to be faithful to the cause, even to his death. So he was a fervent believer, even at an early age. Um, interesting how his mother reacted. His, he had so much Christian zeal, his mother hid his clothes so Origen couldn't go out and potentially get him himself arrested as well. So hiding in home with his mom, um, trying to, to prevent him from being killed as, with, with her husband. So shortly after his father's death, he began to earn a living teaching literature and philosophy. So another person that was um, under, had a pretty good understanding of um, philosophy and the, the literature of the day and, and past folks. Um, through persecution in the church, there was a severe shortage of teachers. So he's showing himself capable. There's not a whole lot of teachers. And he soon was asked to instruct believers in the fundamentals of the faith and adequately prepare for, for baptism. So um, maybe you've heard the term catechism. Yes, and it's yes. more of a, of a cap, uh, Roman Catholic term. But he, he would have these kind of things to help people get the basic understanding of doctrine 
understand that, what it means to be a Christian. Um, and so um, Bishop Demetrius gave Origen the responsibility, who was 18 years at the, old at the time, so young, capable individual teaching, and people were, were loving it. He, he had started under, under Clement in a, um, coming into this teaching role. So before the persecution, he had that, that chance to, to be studying under Clement. Origen um, no, um, not only embraced the teaching, but also adopted a strict lifestyle as a part of his ministry. Um, trying to catch all these typos as I go, so I apologize if I just take a minute here to... Sure. <laughs> it's a little bit annoying because I keep coming back to them and I don't, I don't fix them. I just don't want to go away. Um, <clears throat> so he adopted a strict lifestyle. He viewed this is an important part of being an, an effective philosopher. Um, and other monks and folks like that have done this. And so this is an interesting thing that he's doing, uh, living in a place of poverty, limiting things. So he, he did not sleep in a bed, he got very little sleep. He practiced fasting and sp he's spending much of his time studying scripture. He went, even went so far that he emasculated himself, becoming a eunuch. He was requested to teach bishops some something that was viewed as highly unusual. So um, for the clergy to be taught, it's typically you had to be a clergy member yourself. Um, this caused uh, issues in, in initially since he was only a layman. Um, with continued church order disagreements, the bishops finally ordained him so he could no longer would no longer be an issue. So he was actually showing his abilities even before he was given that from a church point of view. And like he was teaching without a credential, so they just gave him yeah. one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, Jesus never got a degree. You know, he yeah. Got a, you know, but, um, so, um, so we're seeing his father as he stood over the, the sleeping youth, Leonidas, beaming with pride. He lifted up his hands and glorified God by giving him such an extraordinary son. He had provided him the best education that Alexandria had to offer. When he was only 17, Origen was clearly Clement's brightest student. So now this is um, from the author, and I was quoting some other resources. We're seeing a little bit more of the same well, from the author's point of view. It's sad that the recent trouble had caused the school to shut down. No matter, the most important thing was that his boy continued to make progress in prayer and to study God's word, and he could do that at home for now. So his, his father is, is really laying everything out for his son. He gets killed. Um, and, and Origen survives. Leonis was especially grateful that his son's zeal for God was even greater than his zeal for his studies. So he was a good student, but even more than he was, he was a strong and powerful believer. Um, Eusebius was, is this um, historian that we're very thankful for him because he wrote an extensive history of the early church, doing quotes for what was him, you know, at his fingertips, he could write it down. But for us, we've lost some of those books. And so you see this is a very important resource for us for, for this time period. It tells us about the remarkable, remarkable prodigy from Alexandria named Origen. So he just wrote and wrote and wrote, and very talented. If Origen could not witness to, to Christ through martyrdom, he knew he was free to die with Christ through a life of self-sacrifice. So, so he... he took literally the counsel of Jesus to the apostles who wrote, no, he wore no shoes and permitted himself no more than one set of clothes. Till his dying day, he slept not in a bed but on the floor. And he concentrated uh, his sexuality to Christ, embracing celibacy for the sake of the kingdom. 
so really very um, intense and on fire with his faith. Although I think some of the, these things that he did were were not things that we're called to do. But um, is that where we get? Is that where uh, Catholic priests get their celibacy stuff from? Um, I would say that this would be a, one of those strong factors that would be part of the case. You know, um, what do we do with ourselves? Is it better to to serve Christ or have a family? You know, Paul and others can say, you know, there's, there is some diversity of opinion. But you see um, Origen coming out, who is portraying this lifestyle. I think the difference would have a strong impact. Um, so what happened during this persecution? All of their family's property was confiscated by the government. Um, so what they were saying, Linolius's great crime of sharing Christ with others for, for the government crackdown was not so much for being a Christian, but for making others Christian. Origen did what he knew to earn money for his family, he taught the Greek classics, but soon the persecution died down. The Bishop Demetrius wanted to reopen the, um, the school. With Clement, um, with Clement somewhere in Asia Minor, who would lead it? Demetrius selected the child, one and not yet 18, to succeed in a manner published scholar in his 50s. So, um, another insight into um, what was going on there. So he was the first th theologian, um, a Christian theologian classically understood as faith-seeking understanding, began with Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So he started with the um, looking at the Gospels. And... Um, And theology as the scientific and systematic ex exposition of all Christian doctrine explains logically as a co uh, co coherent ho um, whole that began with origin. So um, really the first one that really could be talking about himself as the theologian, it really started with with, um, with the origin of trying to have a very systematic, um, um, coherent approach to putting these all together. And his book, De, De Principius, on first principles, is the first serious attempt to put it all together in a work of systematic theology. This is something that we know fairly well now. But at this time, this is something that was still new, that no one had ever tried to do that. And so um, theological development, it took time. And um, he didn't get everything right, but you know, he was definitely trying to, to, to figure these things out. <clears throat> Everywhere in the writings of the early church fathers, we see evidence of the church being belief in the divi divinity of Christ. Origin is a witness to the apostolic tradition on this. Before creation and time, God the Father begot the Son, but the generations of the Word is an eternal happening. So we're not talking about that, you know, Jesus is the first creation, but he's also trying to be aware of this, this positional relationship that exists between the Father and the Son. There is no time that he was not. So he's, he's trying to, to talk about the timelessness of, of God. Um, so this is, was not a new tradition, but Origen is developing this further. Um, and in this effort to explain truth of the Trinity and mystery of how the divine and human are related to the person of Jesus, which is Christology, the, the nature of Christ, coined um, Greek terms and phrases to, to capture these. And I'm going to try and avoid making a fool of myself trying to pronounce these things. Um, so he used the word for being, he used the word for nature, and he coined this term God-man. And Jesus was, was the only God-man that ever existed. 
Um, <clears throat> and he gets this all from the from from the Gospels. Yes, he's reading the Greek scriptures, and he's he's trying to bring that you know the typically like you have a, the letters and the, and stuff they're written for a specific purpose and then the theological um, endeavors trying to take what is the general truth that we then can apply to any time that's the, the the theological development part and that's what he was trying to construct you know this is something i always um it's actually i'm actually glad to hear this stuff because this has always been um a, a hard point was especially when speaking with um uh, anybody who denies the trinity um, like Jehovah's Witnesses, Mormons, and stuff. And when you talk yeah. to them, and it's it's easy to see it throughout Scripture. It's easy to sh it's easy to to look throughout Scripture um, where it's where it's taught that Jesus is God, where the Holy Spirit is taught as God. Well, the Trinity is all over Scripture. Um, but I always wondered where do we get because they always say, well, where did the word Trinity come from, or where, you know, the word Trinity is not even in the Bible, or things like that. But um, getting to see that the early theologians, the early church fathers uh taught this and, and believed it and they were so close to the apostles and then the apostles were right there with jesus so it's it's just it strengthens um you know your faith in that one of my um professors that had a big impact on me he would always say again and again the highest christology is the earliest christology so he would always be pointing back to the to the apostles and what they wrote and what they passed on to their disciples, what they put in their letters, and stuff like that. So you're it's exactly true, and so eventually they had to come up with the words to capture this, and so that's the the word whatever you you had to call it something. So the word that they settled on was Trinity, yeah. uh, and it's not just a, a creation of man. It's taking what we know to be true in Scripture, and making it making a theological statement of putting that together in a in a way that we can convey that concept as we're understanding all of Scripture, putting it together, and having these ideas that we can see as a result of being um, changed by by God's word. So, good point. Mm -hmm. So, Origen contributed widely to Christianity. He, he was a man of the Bible and a pioneer in every aspect of biblical scholarship. Um, he, following the, tra the tradition handed down to him, Origen believes scripture is God-breathed or inspired by the Holy Spirit. Biblical inspiration did not mean the authors were inspired, but rather that the text is inspired. So it's not just that they felt this warm feeling it's it's act, when they were writing that the text that the the Holy Spirit was working through them to be creating a text that they wanted that the the Holy Spirit wanted to make sure that this was going to be captured. The, and so the Holy Spirit in in the Bible dwells in the text and in the temple. And so it's an interesting we we can be thinking of like the the Jewish temple. But it's also the same Holy Spirit is there in the midst of these texts that we're getting written down and, and um, we have. Martin knew that there are many Bible authors and they wrote in many different styles. But they were they were all um, inspired by the same Spirit. All the books are are held together and made alive as the soul holds the body together and animates it. So these are some, some of the ideas that he was trying to capture. For him, one must always approach a text as a unitary book that is pulsating with divine life. Um, he took a um, cue from Paul when it came to the interpretation of the Bible. Spiritual things must be understood spiritually. A person wants to penetrate beyond the letter to the spirit. He needs to keep... Um, of, of the same Holy Spirit who inspired the text. So the student of Scripture must be eager not only to study, but to pray. Mm -hmm. Using Christ comes to meet us in Scriptures, not merely to inform us, but to transform us. Mm -hmm. So those are some another set of thoughts for us to be thinking about. Um, Origin, and just to finish up with a couple charts talking about his le legacy. 
So since he was a first and he was trying things, he, you know, you could say the way that the text says there was chaff mixed within the, um, the wheat that Origen had developed in his genius. He was a daring pioneer who veered off the road into the bush from time to time. But this is only because the road had not yet been marked out by the church. So um, some of his ideas like the pre-existence of the soul and final salvation of everyone and, and demons came from Platonism. The, so he was trying to leverage your as, aspects from philosophy. Um, and so it would make sense that he would be in, within his arsenal using some of the things that were the cultural concepts. Um, so d does that mean he believed in uh, not in, that there's not an eternal hell when it says final salvation of everyone? I think maybe one of the word here is final salvation of everyone. Is everybody saved? Um, what is the exact nature of us before we were born, the pre-existent self, you know, but before you were born? Yeah. Um, so that there, there's some, some nuances here that are coming in and you know, I just took a short excerpt from the text, so it may not be getting the full meaning. Okay. Um, The Greek thought that they um, did not, they believed that the world is eternal or was not a beginning, as I understand, if I remember off the top of my head. And so what is this pre-existence of the soul? Um, even our souls had a beginning, you know, um, the, that, that gets into more. It's, 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 interesting more to hear, it's, a, it's interesting to hear the uh, different thoughts, like you just said right now, that the soul, that the, that the earth, is like our life right now is a tunnel. It's not the beginning. There's something before. There's something after, and we're just kind of in this tunnel. And I yeah. read this other book talking about Mayans, the, like the, the, uh, the, the uh, natives of the, of the Americas, yeah. before Christopher Columbus, and what they believed. And they believed that uh, life is just like a light between two endless darkness is like there's nothing before there's nothing after there's just this little bit it's like the opposite <laughs> of what yeah. he's saying so it's just crazy to hear all these different everyone has different ideas just like in genesis and even in john it talks about in the beginning you know we know that there is a beginning so this is not something that fits in so he was mm -hmm. trying to figure yeah. out how you put these philosophical ideas but there seems some truth to that put that in scripture and didn't always get it quite right but you know that's what um theological doctrinal development is something that that takes time and so he was really giving us a, a construct to to flesh it out even further yeah um long after his death um some turned to origin speculative um, suggestions into doctrinal positions which were condemned by the church so um, some things it took a while for it to get those things cleared up. Um, and here is um, another example that some of the doctrines that were attributed to, to origin, they were con condemned. Um, and so one of the things they did is they destroyed some of his writings. So there are other ones that we don't have access to and use all of that, but we have plenty. If you were to look into some of these early church writing um, anthologies, you'll see plenty for, for origin. So that was a quick tour of origin. Just that kind of, that's kind of a warning too, though. Um, because there's, I have, I've had a lot of friends so that when in young adults, when our young adults ministry when we were in, and and they were, they would like, they were very, very um, devout Bible scholars, and they just would pour through the scriptures and read all these books and try and get all this knowledge. But sometimes what would happen is they would get really, really deep and start thinking too much, and then they'd start going off into these other. Like one of them's in a cult now, I think, and <laughs> there's um, just different. So what happens, I think, sometimes is you, you start to try and um, 
you, you start to try and understand things that obviously God, we, we, there's no way we can understand. And uh, you try to over complicate things that are very simple in the Bible where, you know, it says the Bible wants us to, or I think the apostles said that, that they want us to keep it, things simple, um, keep it simple. And, and, and when we try to over complicate it, we veer off a little bit. So that's kind of a warning too. Yeah. It's, um, you know, some people get some weird ideas and other people kind of agree with them and you can kind of get into that little eddy, that little off the, the main path, if you will. But I think it's also, if you just look at the, the lion's share of how people are putting these things together and what makes sense, what are what's a testament of people that are, are well-known, were respected, that um, have stood the test of time rather than some kind of a little thing that, you know, gets a little bit of a voice there. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, what you're saying is like there's a simple truth to the, the, the simplicity, the, the essence, the major part of what the gospel is all about. Um, if you're not careful, like we talked about Gnosticism, it's an idea whether it has some appeal in some of this idea of thinking about the spiritual. And, um, but if, you're, if you keep wandering too far in any of those areas, um, if you're not, if you don't have a, a balance per se, um, all kinds of things can be um, come up. You know, yeah. and, you know, Satan's had thousands of years to figure out what are the things that are going to be teasing man's mind and to get him off track. And mm -hmm. so, but just to be focusing on the the essence of the gospel and stuff like that. But there are answers to all of those things. You know, so it's a it's a matter of um, how much time and energy you, you want to be focusing on. Uh, it's like I heard one person say, getting a PhD is learning so much that you realize how little you know. Because <laughs> there's, there's just so much out there. And you, you can think of like God or, you know, more specifically, just to give an example of Jesus. It's like he has a PhD in everything possible. You know, that's just like the, the mind of God far beyond us. And so maybe just try and grapple and understand something. Well, I think this next person that we're going to cover may be an interesting person to to think about in the context of um, how people are doing in their faith and maybe getting so ingrained in something and getting a little bit off the beaten track. And that actually is what happened with Tertullian. He had some very... Um, insightful and useful things and he, he is considered a one of the church fathers but towards the end of his life he he got so quote rigorous in his faith and went, he moved on to this rigorous movement um, that really was denying that the grace and the ability for for people to change that um, really had a very negative impact and some say that he struggled with mental health issues towards the end of his life. Mm. So Tertullian is um, another person that was from this um, northern Africa area, um, from the area of Carthage. So just going back to the map and giving a context there. Um, so at about the age of 40, is. Um, when Tertullian um, converted to Christianity. Um, so after his conversion, he returned back to Carthage, the place of his birth, and this was about 150 AD. At this location, he wrote extensive um, about the, the newfound faith he adopted. So within his writings, he defined he defended against those who objected to it and defended against those who tried to corrupt it. So um, interesting that he um, was very, um, very much um, passionate about his faith. And so that, that was a, a good thing. Um, in about 107 AD, he left his African church and followed the way of Montanism. So this is one of these um, heretical areas that um, he was falling into. Um, 
This may have been a response to displeasure in how repentant sinners were handled in the, in the growing church hierarchy. And um, Tertullian always held the belief to a high moral standard. So this rigorous point of view is even being seen here. He's turning towards um, um, a, a heretical area um, and, and also having this the seeds of um, having this um, mandate that there has to be a high moral standard in which we judge believers. He seems to... What is Montanism? Um, this is one of the things that we talked about uh, before. And um, let me see if I can pull up the text. And... So... When we were talking about the different kinds of heresies that were out? Yeah, I think... Um... Give me a second. I think I found a place for it. Montanus. Um, yeah. Uh, it says right here, Ebionitis, Marcion, and Montanus. Yeah. What page is that? Do you have it? Um, it's on page 16 of the packet that you gave. Oh, okay. Yeah, I was trying to, I was going to show you it in the, the text. Um, So there's a couple of places where it comes in, but um, this is on page um, 70. So to prepare to understand Marcion's point of view, it is best to ask yourself a few questions. Have you read the Old Testament and run across the passage, let's say, in Judges or, or Joshua, where the brutal warfare carried out by all Israelites, seemingly at God's command, it was a bit disturbing? Have you ever had problems reconciling such passages with, with the Sermon on the Mount? Did you ever wonder how the Old Testament image of God's wrath squared with the merciful Father revealed by our Lord Jesus? Um, well, Marcion wondered about these things, and the answer came up was all, all the problems entirely. He taught that the reason for the very two different pictures is simply because there are two um, are two very different gods. For Marcion, the god of Moses and the prophets, was an evil demiurge. Yeah, we learned about that in Marcionism. Marcionism. Right. And then Montanism, it says um, they had some belief in a new, a new prophetic revelations. Yeah, and so this is a Montanism. And so this is another movement from Asia Minor. Um, So he felt like he had new revelations, this new prophecy, as it was called, raised a very important question. Maybe God is not finished, or perhaps there is a totally new revelation to, to come from these, from these prophetical ideas. And so Irenaeus was trying to, to go against all these things. So, um, True wisdom does not involve in many new dis, um, doctrines like what was seen in Gnosticism or Montanism. Well, cutting out what we don't like it is what the Ebionites or Marcion was doing. Rather, it, is, it consists in working out the things that we have, have been said in, in parables and building them into the foundation of the faith. So those are just um, some of the thoughts on from Irenaeus and how he was trying to, to deal with this. And we're seeing this a little bit later, that Montanism was still um, there, and I also was talking about um, Marcion as well. Okay? Yeah. So, um, it's in the greater area of Carthage, but um, um, Tunisia Today he conjures up the image of desert sands and the sound of the Muslim call to prayer. But in the days of the early church, the Mediterranean um, 
uh, was a, a Roman lake, and its northern African shore was dotted with towns as Roman as you could find in nearby Sicily. So it's interesting what's if we get into the, the understanding of what it was actually like, we can get a, a, a better understanding of the, the nature of things. Um, before being conquered by Roman legions some centuries early, Northern Africa's principal city was Carthage. Um, and it had been a center of child sacrifice. In the second century after Christ, blood was still being split there, only it was of the blood of martyrs. And so this is the situation that we have. So um, he was a son of a centurion. Um, so he, he was in this provincial world of northern Africa. Um, and his full name was Quintus um, Sempitus Florens Tertullianus, um, or Tertullian for short, fortune, um, received an extensive education, mastering both Greek classics and Roman jurisprudence. So he practiced law for a few years in Rome. He returned to his homeland. Like many young men of his day, Tertullian amused himself with um, frequent sexual adventures, which continued even after he was married. So I think this is probably one of the things that um, made him become a very rigorous, probably struggling with um, his own past. As he struggled with a general sense of disgust for the meaningless of his own lustrous life, he attended public games where he witnessed the martyrdom of some Christians. So once again, we're seeing the power of this witness of the martyrs in, in the, the arena, or was meant to be sports, and somehow these people were worthy of dying because they weren't going to declare um, the emperor a god and deny their faith, and they would call them atheists, things that we think are kind of strange. Mm -hmm. um, he heard the way they answered the magistrate. He noticed the way that uh, they supported one another. As a lawyer, he knew criminals and these were not criminals. Rather, they were virtuous people who had both the courage to die and sometimes worthy, something worth dying for. Um, Tertullian was so moved that he found himself seeking to know more. Soon afterwards, he presented himself for baptism. So he became a believer and acted on that faith in baptism. This was when he was about 34 years of age. Um, and then this rigorism. Um, so we have this um, 19th century cardinal, um, John Henry Newman, um, who is an expert in, in the history of doctrine, said that the original sin of heresies is impatience. Sadly, Tertullian, for all his zeal, was affected with the sin in the extreme. He didn't have patience for people to actually be in process and just really work things out. He was not aware of his weakness. He confessed in the beginning of his treatise on patience that, that Tertullian's writing about patience is like an invalid writing about health. He always wrote as an angry man. He didn't want to just confront and have an apology. He wanted to destroy his opponent. Um, he wanted to annihilate them. First the pagans and then the heretics um, were the place where he had his biting and sarcastic um, um, pursuits. Then he turned his fire upon the bishops of, of, of the church. Um, so in reaction to his own pre-baptismal lifestyle, he had always been prone to severity and, and rigidity. So it's no wonder they would find it um, of use and be attractive to, to be looking at this new prophecy of the Montanists. Irenaeus, Irenaeus had to battle the, their theology and um, and the idea of the new um, prophecy could in fact supersede prior revelation, but part of this heresy was rigors in the idea that the serious sexual post-baptismal sins like fornication, adultery, along with murder and apostasy could not and should not be forgiven by the church. The bishops, according to the Montanus prophecies, had no authority to do so. So there was no forgiveness of sin, according to him. You know, you're stained and that's just the way it is. 
If anyone could forgive sins in the name of Christ, these prophets proclaim that must be the holy and inspired ones, such as themselves, not the corrupt bishops of a lax church. So interesting perspective. Um, so he's entrenched in this point of view. And what seemed to happen is that he gradually fell from the, the spell of this um, rigorous sect and remained in it for about 20 years. He apparently died bitter and resentful in self-imposed exile from the peace and communion of the Catholic Church. The, the Tertullian, in spite of himself, had been used mightily by God. His writings are an important witness to the apostolic tradition, even though he broke with that and, and that tradition near the end of his life. Ironically, his most original contribution to clarifying and developing that tradition with regards to Christ and the Trinity were made even as he himself was drifting away. So the Lord can use us all in whatever kind of a situation that we find ourselves. Um, and the Lord is a, is a God of grace. And in the midst of that, he was working with Tertullian. Um, and I'm sure now he can experience God's grace in a way that he couldn't have imagined previous to that. Um, hold on just a second. Of course. Sorry about that. Oh, um, this is actually, um, Cyprian is an interesting person. Um, and there's also a, a current event aspect of this that's um, I could point out. Um, I have to exit out of this to see what happens when I do this. Um, This is an article in Christianity Today that um, with COVID-19, we're, we're seeing um, interesting things about plagues. And, uh, and Cyprian was actually in a time when it was an extremely bad plague. Um, so um, in the third century um, AD, so Christianity emerged um, into history that they were finding themselves that um, they were demonstrating their faith that when most people were fleeing because of this this um, pandemic that was there, they were actually staying and ministering to these individuals. Um, when it was at its peak, there was like 4,000 people dying a day. And with the COVID-19, it's not quite hit that, that amount worldwide, but it people were starting to see the character of these, these individuals, that these people loved one another, risking their lives. But, you know, they were seeing that there was something more important in life and that itself is that all of these individuals, they have value. And so the, the church in action was doing what others, no one else was willing to, to do. And um, as a result, um, after the end of the plague, a lot of people came to Christ because they just saw that once again that this this witness of these individuals in a very practical way. So uh, I won't spend too much time about that, but um, since it was concerning the time of Cyprian, um, who was the bishop of, of Carthage, um, it's it's interesting to to bring that into to light. Um, he was thinking. Um, you know, the, the Lord was using this as in a powerful way um, that they were seeing the, the decay of the Roman Empire. And so there's an age old, an old age of, of the world. Um, but yet we have this upcoming of what was happening with, with Christ and Christianity. Um, and so it was, it was slowly revolutionizing society from within as a result of the, the more and more people becoming believers. And so just the whole fabric of society was being sustained and then built up. And this book was actually at the peak, there was 5,000 people a day in Rome that were dying every day, which was pretty phenomenal. 
And it's not the first time that um, individuals that were Christians stayed where other people fled. Um, Rodney Stark um, is a um, uh, historian. He writes in his book, The Rise of Christianity, he describes how Christianity remained in afflicted cities where others fled and cared for the sick and dying. That was that was impressive that um, also had a, a real effect. Clean, cleaning and hydrating sufferers increased their chances of survival. So not only did they care of them, but there was a, a much higher rate of recovery as a result of these individuals caring for them. Christianity's sharp advantage was the inexhaustible ability to forge kinship networks among perfect strangers based on the ethic of um, sacrificial love. Rather than being on, on family, rather than it being on um, your caste where you were in society, any Christians, they can get together and they can have this sense of community. This was also something that was not typically, typically seen in the Roman world. So since that was a, a timely thing that's going on for right now, I figured it would be worthwhile taking a, a moment just to, to include that as well. Any comments or questions? Well, hopefully uh, we start a revival with this plague <laughs> like that did. Yeah, I, I agree. And um, we're going to see what the impact of the church um, after this starts to um, run its course. Um, one of the things that's happening that's um, I've heard many people say is a lot of people are, you know, in lockdown. And so they're spending a lot of time online and a lot more people are clicking in and watching churches. And so people are getting exposed to the gospel in the, the safety of their own home. And I'm really hoping that that can bear some fruit as we go along. Yeah. So back to our map. Um, here's where Cyprian is in um, in Carthage, um, northern Africa. And so um, that's uh, another point of reference for us to be thinking about. Um, so this is a little bit of a step forward. And so a lot of things have changed since Tertullian's time. Um, so Gnosticism and Marcionites had disappeared from the Northern Africa scene. Um, although being a Christian was still technically a crime, um, you had to talk to elderly to hear stories of martyrs. So there had been a peace for a, a, a period. And um, so for over 40 years, um, there had been this, this piece. One of the new members um, even came from one of the richest and most cultured families in Carthage, and that's where we have Cyprian. Um, he was a prominent professor of rhetoric or public speaking, so he was a really good speaker. He could teach people how to do it. Um, he knew how to put words together in a way that could convince people. He knew how to make money um, it was early in his career, and he was already a wealthy man. So um, people would want to hear him. They would want to be taught by him. Um, and in the midst of that, um, his dissatisfaction with his own dissolute life had led Cyprian to the baptismal font. So he's moving in the direction that the Lord was gave him a spiritual hunger found the Lord, and so we're seeing this being um, somewhere in the time of A.D. 460. So shortly after the Enlightenment, he had put his pen to parchment and started his experience. Um, and here's a quote from him. I, I was entangled in a thousand errors of my previous life. I did not think, I could not free of it. Um, get free of them, for I was so much the, the slave of my vices, and I had such compliance, compliant, comp, compliance um, complacency, I'll just say that, in the evils, which had become my constant companions. 
but my regeneration of water washed me from the, the stains of my previous life and uh, a light from on high shone into my heart that purified me from its corruptions and the spirit coming from heaven changed me into a new man by a second birth and immediately in a wonderful way I saw certitude take the place of doubt. So a clear and profound transformation and we can just see how eloquent he is just by the way he, we, we see this quote how it's developed. So even though he was of the same profession as Tertullian in his training, Cyprian was a totally different in personality. It must be admired that um, Cyprian lacked Tertullian's originality and penetrating genius. However, he was what Tertullian lacked. Gentleness, self-control, a warm and generous spirit. Mm -hmm. So instead of condemning and, and attacking and, um, individuals that he was um, going up against, he would be showing love and care and warmth. These attributes, along with his great eloquence, helped to explain why he was ordained a priest within a year. He also explained why, when the, the see of Carthage became vacant, so the, 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 the bishop became a, um, vacant a year later, the people elected him bishop over the, the stringent protests of the, the senior clergy. So here's this young guy, relatively speaking, he won the hearts of, of the city and became the, the bishop and, and leader of the church. With little experience or anything. <laughs> yeah, sounds a little bit like some of the other folks that we've talked about. Mm -hmm. So Cyprian had scarcely become a, a, a min, um, the, the, the bishop when a new emperor came to power. Decius wrote a new law that finally put teeth in the ancient statute against Christianity. Um, all citizens were now required to obtain an official document certifying that they had sacrificed to Caesar and the gods. Um, the goal was to swiftly uh, decapitate the church by first going after its leaders. And so that's going to be a real problem for, for Cyprian for, for sure. And as I try and capture all these typos. Um, these are things people are afraid of nowadays, too. It is. Um, we are moving in the direction of having more and more persecution, and it um, it's, it's interesting, it's subtle, but there's a shift of what morality means. The Judeo basis for what's right and wrong is no longer the basis that a growing number are actually abiding to. And um, we don't really want to get into to some of the issues in, um, um, in a specific way. But just to, to think on that line, that we're actually considered immoral because of the the growing prevailing view is holding to a different sense of what is right and wrong, mm -hmm. which um, it's it's kind of leading down this path that um, they were struggling with, that they had a way of life in this this growing sect, you know, from the the Roman government point of view, is um, is causing a, a rift that they're trying to prevent it from going any further. It's almost like that's like we're that's something that we're leading into is a this this um what is the word I'm looking for uh, uh when you give somebody a, a uh, you give somebody a um they either have to do it or they don't do it uh, ultimatum ultimatum there you go this, yeah they have this ultimatum they have to have this official document certifying that they sacrifice and I mean we're moving towards that, like we're we're gonna have to you know be given an ultimatum just like daniel did you know you have to, you have to do this if you want to live you know yeah and unfortunately there's could be multiple ways in which that can happen if we continue to move away from this base and um so this law went into effect and on um, january 1st 250 <clears throat> three weeks later the pope was was martyred 
Wow. So you can see how this has a huge impact. Um, after so many years of peace and so so many new comforts, the complacent Christian community was unprepared for such a ferocious attack. Um, so as they worked their way down the, the chains of command, the, the authorities worked their way down, and so they were looking for Cyprian. But he didn't find him in a dream. God had warned him to go into hiding. And so he, um, he had taken refuge into a friend's villa in the countryside. He directed his flock to letters sent by the select deacons who were the only ones who knew his whereabouts. Though it lasted only 14 months, the persecution left in its wake many broken relationships. Um, Decius um, persecution had been the most devastating to date, but it was not the last. Cyprian had been back at the helm in Carthage, but six years when the next emperor uh, broke under Emperor Valerian. The first thing that was a decree to exile all bishops, forcing Cyprian once again to leave his flock and take up residence in the countryside, this time under imperial scrutiny. And shortly thereafter, unrepentant bishops were condemned to death. Cyprian gave his witness and was beheaded in AD 258, shortly after Pope Stephen, like Fabian, gave his life for his sheep. Um, well, you last, you martyred again, I'm sorry? 258. 258. Um. So the lax schism schema, um, schematics in Carthage didn't take long. Um, but even after Novation's death under Valerian, his rigorous schism lived on for several centuries in Carthage and many cities. The crisis of the lapse did not go away, and the, the questions raised by the, the crisis would have to wait nearly two centuries for an answer. Ironically, some of those answers would be provided by a later North African bishop named Augustine, who both revered and gently disagreed with Cyprian. So um, kind of a nice way to, to flush out the, the story there. And, um, on Cyprian. Any other questions on that? No. It's just a lot of, there's a lot of, there's a lot of uh, things to glean off of that, off of that, listening to that. The first thing they did was attack the leaders, the church leaders. And it says that also that, that the, um, you, it, it, it was written right there that the, uh, the, the church was complacent and they weren't ready for it. So it gives us warning too, to make sure that we're, you know, we're sober minded, you know, um, keeping our heads in the things of the Lord, continuing vigilantly or vi uh, vil uh, diligently and, and reading the scriptures and in our faith and so that we can be ready for something to come. But it says they weren't ready for it. And the, and also they went after the, the leaders, which is interesting to think about and pray about as well. Yeah, it is. Um it's a strange fact that when we're under persecution, you know, when we're being chastened or disciplined by the Lord, it seems like our faith grows more. And unfortunately, in the, the larger aggregation of the church, that same thing starts to, to show up. Um, I think I'll do one more, and we'll talk about Hippolytus. And um, this is a person that I looked at um, in, in one of my classes in seminary. And so someone before that I never heard of, but um, an interesting individual who was had one foot in the, the Greek world. He was fluent in Greek, but also where things were going as things were moving towards Latin. And so a lot of the writings were now starting to be written in Latin people that were proficient in Greek were starting to become a minority. And so, and he he was in Rome. And so that's just a little bit of backdrop, but very faithful to scripture and the, um, and wanted to be faithful to theological constructs that were, were known. 
So he ended up in a controversy over the Trinity and the forgiveness of sins with two prominent bishops, um, Zephyrinus and um, Colostus. Um, he refused to acknowledge Colossus in 217 AD as bishop, thinking his views were heretical. Um, so this created a rift in the Roman church with those following Hippolytus and those following Colossus. Um, Hippolytus developed his Trinitarian doctrine in opposition to modalism, representing, um, he represented it in, in his case by my notice of Smyrna, according to Hippolytus, so suppose Christ was father himself and the father was born and suffered and died, and so everything was in the father. Via Sibelius, the, the defense of modalism became known as Sibeliism. Hippolytus claims Colatus spoke about the father suffering jointly with the son, and Hippolytus took exception to this. So th there's interesting nuances that start to um, become important that, that we're trying to, to, to deal with. Um, excuse me as I need to try and fix some of these minor typos. Okay, so and like I said, we're getting down to the end of this the line in terms of the spiritual legacy. But I still think it's kind of interesting. Um, you studied Polycarp. Polycarp was a disciple of John. Irenaeus was a disciple of Polycarp. And Hippolytus was a disciple of Irenaeus. And so there's that spiritual relationship that we have um, that we can start to pull out through um, the early church writings and how they um, self um, testify to the impact of people that help them in their faith. Um, Hippolytus was in Rome, and so it would make sense that the language as Rome became more proeminent and the Greek influence started to um, go down, that Greek um, would start to be less and Latin would be more. And so things for, for Greek would start to be more in Greece versus that in Rome. Um, Origen and Hippolytus on past cross. One of the highlights of Origen's life had been that he paid a visit to the ancient city of Peter and Paul. When in Rome, he had heard an awe-inspired homily on the praise of the, the Lord our Savior, preached by one of the most prominent clerics of the city. We don't know how, we don't know much about the background of, of that preacher Hippolytus, who was likely born around the time Justin was martyred. Um, so um, Hippolytus heard Origen. This is something that was influential for him. Heard him in, in, um, in Rome. Um, what we do know about Hippolytus is that he was brilliant and energetic, much like the young man from Alexandria who he heard a sermon that day in AD 212, Origen, who began his ministry at a young age. Hippolytus was already famous since he, he had already been writing for 10 years. Perhaps his example gave Origen a nudge he needed to be to begin writing. Just a few years earlier, Hippolytus had written the very first biblical commentary in Christian history on the book of Daniel. He also wrote a book against many heresies, which was followed years later from an even more detailed book on the subject. This is a chart that I put together um, as I was trying to map through some of the... Hi! <laughs> Hi! 
some of the things that um, Hippolytus um, was was leveraging here, and um, he was enmeshed in the Greco-Roman culture. Um, he was key in the defining of the emerging church, and so we were going from we we sort of had this this dynamic. We have Jesus who poured his life into the apostles, and the apostles poured their lives into their disciples. And we just saw how there was this multi spiritual generation pouring down into Hippolytus. And Hippolytus has one foot into this um, age of the um, of the um, leaning on the the eyewitness and the testimony that was passed on the to now this. Fathers. Yeah, the apostolic fathers, and now going in the direction of where things were in the church. And we have these these popes that he's dealing with, some that he's not going to go along with because um, they're having these heretical views. And um, so this is kind of the, the, the nexus of what we find Hippolytus being and his impact in, in that light of the early church. Um Interesting that I've been showing this picture several times, but it's actually a statue of Hippolytus, and there's actually has some inscriptions on it that um, hold the fact that it is Hippolytus. And so he had a falling out with the, the, the Roman church, um, but then he comes back, and we'll talk about that as such. So he was revered enough that they had a statue erected because of his prominence of what he was doing. Being a faithful witness for the, the truth of Scripture. Um, so it dates back sometime shortly after Hippolytus' death and was dug up in Rome in the 16th century. This is a, this is a sensational find for a few reasons. First, it shows how much he was admired in Roman in Rome during his lifetime and for years afterwards. We find no statue of other Christian leaders from this period. The other thing about the statue is an extensive list of uh, Hippolytus' writing had been engraved on its base. Mm -hmm. So they wanted to immoralize, um, keep people aware of, of the wealth of the things that he wrote. And so that was uh, the last thing that we, we got there. Um, any questions? Do we know how he died? Um, Actually, that's an interesting um, discussion. Um, while he was um, he was a Christian, and during this time when there was persecution, the 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 the, the Pope was exiled. Um, the Politus was exiled, and so he's with the Pope, uh, and one that he had some disagreement with. They they started to patch things over um, and um, I'm trying to remember some, some of the details um, um, that was an influential part of that he started to have this restoration with, with the church um, I'm trying to remember if he was martyred or not um, I think he did die while he was in exile um, but he did, as a result of the activities, he, he did have this restoration with the, 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 the Roman church and um, was his zeal for the church. He was willing to leave the church. He actually broke away from the church um, at the, this really negative downturn in, in events. But eventually... He, he resurrected the church out of these heretical views that were starting to become prominent. And with the church being fully back to the, the full council of what, what we know is true and um, um, orthodox, that's the, the, the situation of the church when he passed on that he left. Okay, good question. I think that's a good breaking point for tonight. Um, this is going to leave a nice thematic thing about talking about um, Nicaea um, and the, the important issues that started to take place. And then we'll lead in with that with um, what ended up being a, a great persecution um, coming into that, that time.
Um, and then they had the the great um, piece that that took 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 place um, where it was no longer illegal to be a Christian, and that's where we find ourselves in, in Nicaea, where the the emperor in Constantinople we see a switch instead of it from being in Rome. You see the seat of power from Rome was now in Constantinople in the, in the eastern. Um, the eastern part of, of the, the um, Roman world. And so that's what we'll get a chance to talk about as we pick up next week. Okay? Sounds great. Sounds awesome. All um, right, Nick, all right. I, I hope you have a wonderful week, okay? You as well. Thank you. All right. God bless you, bro. God bless you too. Have a great day. Bye.